but it's worthwhile. In large letters uh, in marble on the top are inscribed these words. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation remain secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? That's worth pondering again. God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation remain secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? And the answer is no. Since 1981, I've been crisscrossing the country, telling people about what's happened in our country. When you see 200 years in 20 minutes, it's kind of shocking to believe that the Declaration of Independence, our founding document, has been declared unconstitutional. It's like the frog in the water. Put a frog in hot water and he jumps out. Put him in cold water and turn it up slowly and he boils to death. We boiled to death slowly and we didn't even know it was going on. What's the hope? The hope is schools like Northside Academy. We can no longer count on the public schools. We must train our own young people. Home schools, Christian schools, we must get back where we got off the boat. In the name of King James, defender of the faith, the proclamation of the gospel, the twofold mission of the pilgrims. We must continue in our, public, in our private schools to set forth the principles on which our country is uh, founded because without these principles, we cannot have our liberties. Without God, there's no God-given moral absolutes. A country and a public school system less God is Godless. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. A number of years ago, uh, before I was convinced of what was happening in our society back in the 1970s, when our children were attending public school, I was a member of a public school board. I was sitting there in chapel at Trinity Seminary where I was teaching at the time, and the problems were spinning through my mind. By their own survey, 85% of our kids in that school were taking drugs at least once a week. There were all sorts of immoral things going on, the faculty, the student body, drug pushers in the student body, and all these problems are swirling through my head. And Joe Bailey, the man who wrote the Gospel Blimp, was speaking up there, and I tuned into him with one ear, and I was thinking of these problems uh, on the other side. And he said this. He said, can you imagine Abraham and Sarah sending Isaac to the Canaanite school down the block? My mind began to spin, and I could hear Abraham say, Sarah, the Canaanite bus is here. Is Isaac ready? Somehow I couldn't quite envision it. Somehow I couldn't come to believe that that's what ought to be. And I realized that we were in Canaan and that the Canaanites had infiltrated our country, had conquered our educational system, had made their way to the Supreme Court, had ripped the Ten Commandments off of the walls of our school, and had forbid anyone in effect to teach the Declaration of Independence. Just a few months ago, a teacher on the West Coast was actually charged and convicted of that very thing. He was passing out the Declaration of Independence in his class, a case was taken to court, and the judge ruled that it's unconstitutional to pass out the Declaration of Independence in the public schools. The answer to that is what you're witnessing tonight. These graduates who have been trained in Christian principles in a Christian context, in a Christian school, to restore what has been lost in our culture, to penetrate our society, and to go out and to do what is necessary to do. Edwin Burke, who died in 1797, said this, the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. That's all. These are good men and women who are going to do something. And every dollar you invested in them all the faculty, all the time you have invested in training them, the pastor and the deacons of this church and everyone who has anything to do with it should be proud of the fact that you have invested 
your time, your money, your effort in the most valuable thing that we have, our young people and their minds. You say, what can I do? I'm only one. Edward Everett Hale said that too, but listen to what he added. I'm only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. I came from a non-Christian home. First time I saw a picture of Jesus was at a funeral at a church, and I asked my mother if it was Santa Claus. I was age nine, knew nothing about Christ. Little Sunday school picked me up on their bus and picked me up for 400 times before I committed my life to Christ. We had no books in our home. My father went to the fourth grade. My mother went to the seventh grade. No one in my entire family, I have 100 first cousins, uh, no one in my entire family ever went to college. I made it all the way through high school without ever reading a book. In the 11th grade, they found out I didn't know how to read, took a reading class and had to go uh, to reading class every day because I didn't know how to read. I got kicked out of school in the 11th grade because the teacher in the literature class asked me, how did the tale of two cities end? And I hadn't read the first paragraph, so I said, with a period. <laughs> she had no sense of humor, and the period ended for me. Uh, yeah, I was in the principal's office. Now, the reason I tell you that part of my testimony is that God reached down, and on February 12th of my senior year, God reached down and said, I'm going to make you a scholar. That's funny. I don't know how to read. I'm going to make you a scholar. I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, if God can reach down to somebody whose father went to the fourth grade, who had no books in his house, who never read a book all the way through high school, who got kicked out of literature class in the 11th grade, think of what God can do through a class like this that's well-trained and well-educated to face our world. Moses said, Lord, I can't do it. I can't go. And God said, what's in your hand? It said, a rod. It said, throw it on the ground. It became alive. Pick it up. It became a rod. Stick your hand in your bosom. It became leprous. Uh, pull it, put it back in your bosom. It became cured. Take that rod, Moses, and strike the ground. And the dust became lice, created life. Take that rod and strike the water. And the water divided, and a whole nation was delivered. My challenge to you, the class of 2005, is whatever it is in your hand, give it to God and let him use it. I look back now on 55 years since I graduated from high school, 55 of the most exciting years that I could imagine. I never dreamed even going to the first year of college, let alone getting two bachelors, two masters, a PhD uh, degree, and spending my entire life in academics and writing books. If God can do it in the life of some uneducated, illiterate, uh, rebellious young man, think of what he can do in the lives of dedicated, trained, intelligent uh, young people. We've lost the battle, but the war is not over. You're only one, but you are one. And you can't do everything, but you still can do something. And because you cannot do everything, you should not refuse to do that something that you can do. God bless you as you do it.